I think this could be really cool. Simone Bolivar is a figure that I don't know a ton about. I like I get that he is incredibly important. He's uh I believe he was the first president of like three South American countries. Um he was I believe heavily imperialistic in a way but i don't feel confident talking too much about the guy he's one of those guys who i'm like man i gotta learn so much more about him because he he seems incredibly important what's up with you dude uh if you're getting into the history of the south america spanish america just in general uh he seems like one of the go-to figures to learn about so i'm absolutely excited about this one so we're gonna have six videos we're gonna run through all of them right now and then we'll go into some geography now and we'll see we where we are and how many of those we end up doing all right it was more like six well five almost six it, uh you mean countries he was like the first president of i don't, I don't know something like that uh yeah, he he was uh, he was super president, <laughs> and and they chose the term president, which I I thought was interesting. Uh, which I'm curious if that holds the same weight during this time and with him that it does in the United States, or if it's more or less, or if it's closer to a monarch rather than an elective leader that we think of in the United States. Like, I don't know much about the guy. I have a book about him that I've never opened had it for years i think i just never got around to it so that's a shame uh but we're gonna learn a little bit right now maybe this will motivate me to crack that book open so uh if y'all good i good let's get this one started shots ring out in the ohio valley a handful of militiamen under the command of a 22 year old named george washington oh. have surrounded a tiny force of french colonials Within two years, due to the interwoven alliances and secret treaties, this incident will spiral out into the Seven Years' War. The first truly world war, a war that would be yeah. fought on every continent besides Australia. And the dominoes fall. Yeah, I, that's not where I was expecting to start this, but that's really interesting. Yeah, the Seven Years' War... Uh, is a massive global conflict in the United States. We often refer to it as the French and Indian War, which is uh, not, which doesn't encompass the entire war. It encompasses uh, what was happening in North America, though, uh, because it's the British versus the French people and Amerindians who are in the American. Uh, west-ish at the time i get i guess since we are all kind of clustered on the east coast that would be considered uh pretty darn west at the time though we're far from california at this stage but as important and mind-bogglingly understudied as the seven years war is we're gonna just look at one of its repercussions because its reverberations were felt around the globe this was the great conflagration between England and France. It was the conflict that had to happen eventually. But here in the States, we know it under a different name. We know it as the French and Indian yeah. War. We know it as such because that's the war we Americans fought, but we didn't fight it alone. We were still a British colony back then, and the British sent thousands of troops overseas to help fight back the French forces coming out of Canada. By 1763, mm. the war was over and peace had returned, but with peace comes taxes. After all, someone had to pay for all of those troops Britain had sent over. But a number of colonists didn't much like the idea of higher taxes, and they felt that the Boston Harbor really would be much better if it was tea-flavored. So, they rebelled. Okay, I'm starting to get this, because Bolivar was a revolutionary. He was an American revolutionary. So you set this up, uh, you set the stage with the American Revolution that spawned the united states and we're going to build into the american revolutionary that went beyond that in south america and spawned so much apparently as the uh spanish empire uh is in kind of a slow decline 
rebelled against the British. They were led by a 44-year-old man named George Washington. Some relation. Now, those plucky colonists Indeed. gave a good try of it, but they couldn't really throw off the world's greatest power without some help. So, the world's other great powers, who wanted to give Britain a kick in the pants, mainly the French and the Spanish, said, Hey, that looks fun. Mind if we join? But now someone was going to have to pay for all those supplies and troops the French and the Spanish sent over to the Americans. So the French and the Spanish both implemented new taxes, both at home and, most importantly for our story, in their in the colonies, colonies overseas. Yeah. So then the French revolted, and then the Haitians revolted, and then most of Latin America revolted, because they, understandably, didn't feel like paying higher taxes just to, well, help make sure the U.S. didn't have to pay their higher taxes. Because in the end, it all comes down to taxes. So there, now the stage is set. Now we can dive into the life of the man who embodies both the glory and the tragedy of the Latin American revolutions. Simon Bolivar. 1783. We're in one of the great houses Simon of Caracas. Simon Bolivar. I, I'm, Simon Bolivar. I, I, was, I wasn't completely uh, confident in my pronunciation, so I'll just go with how he pronounced it. I was Simon Bolivar. Okay. Yes. On the lower That's close floor, to, there's that's a about how I was happening. pronouncing it. All the leading people of the city are there. In the center is a man with eyes like a still lake, talking to the crowd. Upstairs, things are quiet. There's a woman lying in bed, holding a newborn child. The man is Simon's father. The woman is his mother. Soon, they'll both be taken by consumption. Simon would not remember his father, and he would think of his mother less often than of the slave who raised him, Hippolyta. I'm, uh... I'm... Get it? I, I'm I'm enjoying the little bits of Spanish sprinkled in here. Uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish. I haven't talked about it much because I don't like talking about things uh, that uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do successfully. But I'm trying to learn uh, Spanish right now. I'm on uh, 15 days of Duolingo, so haven't gotten super far. But we'll see where I am maybe a year from now. Simon inherited mines and plantations and slaves. The Bolivars were one of the first families of Venezuela, and he one of the richest men in South America. But he wasn't a man yet, he was a child. And there was one thing that he didn't have, Spanish birth. In the Spanish colonial system, there were not only all sorts of deplorable hierarchies of race, but even for those deemed racially pure and white, there was a class system, with those mm, born in yeah. continental Spain being more favorably looked upon than those born in the colonies. The highest government offices were only open to Spanish-born colonists. But this bane wouldn't strike him yet. And there was an entire class of people who were, like, Spanish people who, uh uh had children with the natives uh the spawn of that also created a new racial gray area that was also very difficult instead he grew up as an unmanageable and arrogant child his father had died when he was three his mother when he was nine the care of those in which he was left was sometimes excellent sometimes negligent but it didn't matter he was always more interested in coursing the alleys of caracas with the children of the streets than he was in studying or guidance Finally, though, one tutor, while never able to control him, was able to teach Simon, albeit on his own terms. And so, mm. as they rode through the fields or walked the streets of Caracas, this tutor imparted not a traditional education, but his own personal loves. Rousseau, Locke, and Voltaire. Alas, even this was not to last, as Simon's childhood was set to a backdrop of revolts. Venezuela, and indeed the whole Spanish Empire, was in upheaval. Race revolts and independence movements cropped up and were crushed, each time with more brutality, but each time exposing Spain's ever-slipping hold. Simon's tutor was caught up in one of these So Spain was, like, the first to get, like, the, the uh... The super expansive American empire, like how, the, like the scale of their empire was truly incredible. But it seems like for most of its imperial history, it's in decline. Like it's a very, it, it, it's a very slow decline for a while, but it feels like they peak very quickly and then are just slowly falling for a good amount. There, there's definitely a, economic troubles that uh, plague it throughout the, its imperial history. Revolt and sentenced to permanent exile. And so again, Simon was alone. Soon he was enrolled in the local military academy by an uncle. He chafed at the discipline, but learned much about the art of making war. Soon though, he was shipped off again, this time to Spain. But he wanted this adventure. He was excited to see the continent that he'd heard so much about, the place where the ideas he so admired came from. 
But even on this trip, he got a taste of the declining nature of Spanish power. For when his ships stopped in Mexico City, they were informed that they wouldn't be able to depart right away because of a British blockade. Eventually, yeah. though, he did make it to Spain, and then on to Madrid, where he would finally get his first real education. And there, too, he met Sick. his first great love. Her name was Maria Teresa, and she was from another respectable Caracan family. But unlike Simon, she had been born in Spain and spent her whole life there. He soon so she's considered her, better. After working for a year to convince her father, they were married in Madrid. Now blissfully married, he decided it was time to return to Caracas and take his place in the family affairs together with his new wife. So they set off for the new world. For Simon, this was a return home. For Maria, it was an opportunity to see her family seat for the first time. But as they landed in Caracas, she began to feel ill, and then weak. Within oh, five months, she was dead. Yellow fever had taken Simon's Oh, yellow love. fever, yeah. He tried to stay in Venezuela to manage the life he had inherited, but everything that... I mean, that... It's the story of the Americas in a lot of ways, uh, yellow fever. There reminded him only Not of much her. to say there. And it's so within a year, in normal. 1803, he once again boarded a ship for Spain. But Spain, too, and especially Madrid, only served as a constant reminder of Maria. So when all non-residents were suddenly ordered out of the capital because there wasn't enough bread to feed them, Simon planned a trip for Paris. There, he saw an empire reinvigorated by revolution. He couldn't help but contrast it with Madrid. Here was a city and a nation modernizing, evolving, growing with new republican ideals. He drank it in. He was enchanted by Paris and the promise it offered. But it was... The... French Revolution really is the kicking off of Enlightenment ideals really being put into practice. I mean, there's a lot of Enlightenment ideals in the American Revolution, but I feel they're more overt in the French Revolution. In a lot of ways, you could consider the American Revolution to be a more conservative one. Uh... While they had Enlightenment style thinkers like Thomas Paine, who is considered uh, a student and a continuation of the Enlightenment, uh, even he, while he's identified very much with the American Revolution, he would have been considered pretty darn radical for the American Revolution, more in line with uh, uh, the more radical French Revolution. Uh, so seeing this new world where the enlightenment ideals are really being put into practice it's going to inspire uh, people to start thinking in a very different way about the prospects of revolution the american revolution uh it it kind of crawled in, in the realm of Enlightenment thinking so that the French Revolution could run and uh, so that the revolutions that followed could uh, do their own thing, I guess. It was here that he found his second heartbreak, not at the hands of a woman, but of a man, Napoleon. Simon had seen Napoleon as a beacon of hope, as the new man, yeah, that's a true Republican, strange. serving his state faithfully, guiding a state by his soul and humble wisdom towards liberty, equality, and brotherhood. But then Napoleon placed a crown upon his head. Well, Losing his go. temper one night at a dinner, Simon railed against Napoleon's vanity, his hubris. I was about to say, that that's strange that he idolized Napoleon. That feels like that doesn't fit there, but it, this is... This is a different version of Napoleon. We we don't have the fulfilled version of Napoleon that we uh, associate with his legacy yet. So here we go. His lust for power. This suddenly made him much less welcome in social circles. And his friends, mm. seeing the toll the debaucherous life of Paris had taken on him, decided that it was time for a change. They packed up and took him to Italy. And it was here in this reinvigorating place rich with history you know, you know, Bret Hart, I, I, I love your wrestling work, and you do make a very good point about Thomas Jefferson uh, being... He, he is absolutely an Enlightenment thinker, but a lot of what Thomas Jefferson does is regurgitation of, uh, of old Enlightenment ideas. Uh, he basically repeats a lot of Lockean ideas that are already kind of established. While I would say that... Uh, Thomas Paine more built upon Enlightenment ideals and uh, 
create and, and develop those ideals further. While Thomas Jefferson, he marketed those existing ideas, if that makes sense. Thomas Jefferson had an amazing way with words, but not entirely original. Rather, he took the ideas that existed, he synthesized them into a way that was just so brilliant. That Simon's thoughts and ambitions really took form. It was here on the very hill which plebeian Romans had retired to to win their rights over 2,000. I, I I know you're not actually Bret Hart. I'm just uh, you know just playing. Years ago, that Simon stood and proclaimed that he would not rest until his homeland was free. Soon he departed Europe to head back home, but first he stopped briefly in the United States. Here too he was inspired. He would later say that it was the first time he'd seen a rational democracy in action. But he realized it had its differences, that it would be no template for the revolution he intended. And so, at last, in 1807, at the age of 23, he set foot again in Caracas, filled with dreams, ambitions, and an ardent desire for liberation and independence for his people. He walked the streets of his long-neglected home and wondered what the future might bring. Join us next time and find out exactly what that future brings. Cool. Yeah, so... Simone Bolivar seems like a very interesting figure, and we're going to continue this right now. Um, he is in a unique situation where he's going to start a revolution having witnessed two different uh, revolutions very close to his time um, that follow very similar, uh, I guess, very similar ideals but took very different routes. And looking at the inspiration you can take from that, it's kind of like a perfect opportunity to learn from history. So I'm curious to see what he ends up doing. He, whenever he's depicted, he comes off as, he's got a very imperial mystique to him, but I don't know how that actually manifests in how he actually governed. He just, like, he's got that look where he looks a lot like Napoleon. Not, like, his features, but, like, the way he carries himself. The, the strength that I see in his portrait. I don't know. We'll see what part two has for us. Last we left off, Simon had returned to Caracas. But even as he returned to his home city, burning with a new ardor for revolution and beginning to think about how to make it a reality, events were afoot in Europe. Napoleon, that great wildcard, the great overthrower of tradition, had invaded Spain. <laughs> Napoleonic armies, once the allies of Spain, came tearing into the Iberian Peninsula. The king abdicated, his son was forced to put aside the crown. Napoleon declared his own brother the king of Spain. The court Nepotism. was in confusion, the army uh. was in disarray, central authority had broken down. Small juntas began to crop up everywhere, claiming rightful authority in Spain. But even the most legitimate of these contenders was stuck in a besieged city, surrounded by 70,000 of Napoleon's men. So what were the colonies to do? Were they now the subjects of Napoleon's brother? Or were they to submit to the will of the walled-off junta bottled up in Cadiz? Who or do knew? they run themselves? These questions might not have been the ones foremost in the minds of Europe at the time, but in Caracas they burned through the streets. After much debate, they found a third option. They would create their own junta and declare it in support of Ferdinand VII, the king who Napoleon had deposed. But since the king was pretty much out of the picture and they recognized no other continental authority, this basically meant they were now independent. Sick. With that sorted, they then sent the representatives of the central junta of Spain packing and began self-governance under a council of the leading men of Venezuela. Simon was not to be found among these leading men. To them, Simon was just a youth. He was reckless, rude, a bit dissolute, and yeah, he had returned recently from Europe with a fire in his belly, but they all figured it was just a matter of time before that fire burned out. He was a liability. Mm. But they were broke. They wanted to send a delegation to England, but as a newly established government and with the Napoleonic Wars wreaking havoc on trade, they just didn't have the money to do it. But Bolivar, yeah. that kid was rich, like, really rich. And with all the impetuousness and the arrogance that they'd come to expect of him, Bolivar offered to pay for the whole trip if they would let him come along. 
Even with this generous offer, some of the Council were worried about the idea of Bolivar being one of their official representatives to England. In the end, though, money, money won, talks, man. and they figured, well, he can't put us in too much worse a position than we're in now, so why not? Of course, just to be safe, they sent him with two other older and more respected members of the community. They figured, let Bolivar spend the money, have those guys actually do the work. So Bolivar departed for England, looking to secure recognition and aid for his fledgling nation. Upon arrival, they quickly arranged a private visit with England's foreign minister. They gather at his stately mansion on the edge of Hyde Park and begin right. the meeting. They speak in French because Bolivar, though he was acting as an emissary to England, doesn't know a word of English. The for I mean, French was often used as an international language of, uh, I guess, treaty and negotiation. They, it, French would be a common language for people to speak in uh, as, like, foreign diplomats. So, like, even in England, uh, it's, it's not bad to know French if you're, if you're neither. Foreign Minister takes the lead, stating bluntly, or at least so he thinks, that he needs to know whether Venezuela is seeking total independence or if it's still loyal to the deposed King of Spain. You see, he's trying to signal to them that the Spanish are fighting Napoleon and therefore are now England's allies, which is something he can't jeopardize. So, boldly, knowing this to be his moment to shine, that he will be the one to that convince flag, the English man. to enter in their cause, like Bolivar steps forward before either of the others can respond, and speaks at length, with elegance and passion, about the struggle that has gone into throwing off the mother country's yoke, and the desire of the people to be truly free. Clearly, he didn't get the hint. So, the foreign minister quietly sighs and figures, okay, I'll try again. This time he states, in a way that he finds too straightforward to really even be civil, that England is Spain's ally, so they need to tell him, wink wink, that they aren't planning to totally break from the Spanish crown. One of the others tried to step in and respond, but Bolivar was filled with passion. He knew this was his moment. He mm. had this. He doubled down, offering his most soaring and powerful rhetoric, a cry so passionate that it must move even this stone-faced Englishman. <laughs> and then, at the height of the performance, in a flash of inspiration, the type of monumental genius only he was capable of, he handed the English minister the letters of introduction and the packet of credentials that he'd been given by the government back home, so that the minister may see his people's commitment and passion in their own words. He continued in his most stunning, gripping rhetoric as the minister leafed through the letters from his people. And then he brought it home. The ending was perfect. There is no way that the minister could not see the righteousness of their cause now. The minister was quiet. Clearly he'd been stunned to silence by Bolivar's moving words. When he'd recovered himself enough to move, he sl A lot of these revolutionary, like, and sometimes imperialistic types, a lot of them in their passion come off as very immature and it's, it's an animation here so it might sometimes give off the wrong vibe uh but uh people can often see the passion through the immaturity but sometimes the immaturity it does come to the forefront especially when you see somebody who is uh uh, clearly so new to diplomacy and very uh, grounded in his ideals, which actually keeps him uh, a little less grounded from the reality sometimes. But it seems like he's doing okay, considering. Slowly lifted a single piece of paper out of the packet and handed it across the table. In his passion, Bolivar had accidentally handed the minister all the letters from his people, including the instructions that he'd received from his government. And in those instructions oh. was a note that basically read in Punk. bold letters, you absolutely do not mention the idea of Venezuelan independence. We are not doing that. We are loyal to the king. We are in no way going to try to break off from the king. So whatever you do, do not imply that we are. Before Bolivar's jaw could hit the floor or his face could turn tomato red, the minister landed the one-two punch, sliding Simon's passport across the desk, tapping it with one finger and saying, my Spanish is poor, but isn't the nation you hail from literally called the Supreme Junta of Caracas, dedicated to preserving the rights of King Ferdinand VII? But then the stone-faced <laughs> Englishman laughed and said that he admired Bolivar's zeal. Still, needless to say, none of the Junta's goals were met. No concrete deal on trade or Damn. formal recognition were forthcoming. But there was another man who Bolivar met in London, a man named Francisco de Miranda. 
the one man in all of London whom the delegates were instructed to not meet. Miranda was perhaps the oldest Venezuelan freedom fighter. He was now 60, and for decades That's he'd been agitating old, for South and Central time. American freedom from Spain. He even once launched a catastrophically inept attempt to liberate Venezuela by force back in 1804. And he had dreams like Bolivar had dreams. Not of some mere republic that paid lip service to a monarch back in Spain, but true and complete independence for his native land. He was now residing in London, because after his bungled attempt to take over his country by force, he had taken refuge with the English. His house had become a meeting oh, place nice. for Latin Americans in London. There, Bolivar not only met much of the upper echelons of British and expat society, but he also became fast friends with Miranda himself. Soon, he convinced Miranda that he needed to return to Venezuela, that the people were waiting for him to reignite the fires of revolution. But when they did both return to Venezuela, Miranda was not greeted by a cheering crowd waiting to bestow on him the command of a newly formed republic, but rather a small group of onlookers who, for lack of anything better to do, boredly watched him get off the ship. Slightly miffed but undeterred, they soon threw themselves into politics, suborning a small political party called the Patriotic Society, and using it as a platform Ooh. to run the type of political campaign. So they're, they're really, uh, they're, they're already adopting some of the language of previous rev revolutions. I mean, patriotic, um, it's, it's a word anybody could use, but I think it's clearly very intentional and there's a certain vibe that they are trying to give off with that um so i i like the i like seeing uh little bits of that uh seep into other revolutions F since uh since the age of revolution every revolution has kind of built from the ones that have passed even as we get into more modern revolutions even uh ho chi min referenced uh documents from the american revolution so all the revolutions reference one another which i i think is a really cool thing to see like that's a small detail i i but i'm gonna be looking out for more that had become a staple of london but had never been seen in the southern half of the new world they made inroads with the mixed race peoples who had been largely ignored by the junta of rich whites there was some ego clashing between Bolivar and Miranda, but soon all of that was overshadowed by two great events. First, a member of the newly formed Congress turned out to be a spy for the Spanish Regency and had fled in the night with important papers of state. This incident caused an uproar. Why defend the Spanish government if they were spying on and thieving from Venezuela? But this incident might That's have blown over question. if it weren't for the second piece of news that followed swiftly on its heels. Wellington had defeated another of Napoleon's armies in Spain. The Spanish government would soon truly return. This became a pivot point, one of those seminal moments in going. history where a decision has to be made, and make it the Venezuelans did. They finally declared themselves truly and fully independent. But this independence was an independence by rich whites for rich whites, and as soon as word of the inequities in its constitution spread, slave rebellions and counter-revolution spread with it. That's closer to what the American Revolution was like. While it had a lot of very liberal rhetoric, uh, it was really the elites who took charge. Uh, while I do think ordinary people, uh, because of the revolution, gained more power than they had before, and it kicked things in gear for them to get more power than they had before, um for a good amount of time i i mean you still have property right, qualifications for voting uh you still have slavery and the people who are making the decisions the people who have the power to take political office office they are of the gentry they're not your joe schmo mcgee living next door before long, the inexperienced and inept forces of the Republic were routed, and they turned to the only experienced soldier among them, Miranda, to lead their forces. He did so on one condition, that Bolivar be stripped of his rank and not allowed to participate. This was totally unexpected, to Bolivar and to the ruling council. Bolivar exploded in rage, but Death. there was little he could do, until a sympathetic general brought him onto his staff as an adjunct. Here he served with distinction, proving his valor and value on the battlefield, so much so that Miranda allowed him to bring news of their successes back to Caracas, commending him and recommending that his rank be restored. 
But always in the background, in private, he said that Bolivar fought like a gorilla, undisciplined, with little of the strictures of military hey. life or command. Things soon took a turn for the worse. Spanish officers arrived on the scene and began raising and training an army of the discontent. Then an even greater tragedy struck. An earthquake of unimagined magnitude struck Caracas. Tens of thousands of people died. The financial, cultural, and political capital of the new nation was reduced to ruins. The people thought it was the punishment of God. Troops began to desert, and Bolivar, who was sent to garrison a stronghold, ended up getting fired upon by the very troops that were supposed to be guarding the fort he was to protect. And Dude, through this, Miranda waged an anemic campaign, that, uh... always on the retreat, <laughs> until, in a shock to everybody, he offered a unilateral surrender. He did not consult Congress, he didn't speak to Bolivar. He made the terms with the Spanish as if he were Venezuela's king. Bolivar oh. sensed treason, could only think of it as a betrayal. And Yellow. betrayal was to be <laughs> met with betrayal. On the night before Miranda do, was to slip away, allowing himself passage on a ship while he had locked down the ports to all the other Venezuelans, Bolivar and a group of his friends seized Miranda and turned him over to the local constable, who soon turned him over to the Spanish. Miranda would As die in a prison a few years later, tossed into a mass grave like a common criminal. But Bolivar, in the chaos, somehow managed to slip away before the arrival of the Spanish forces. His family connections kept him safe, and he plotted his next move in a fight he considered far from finished. The fight for Venezuelan independence. Okay, so it, it was not so simple. So the this is rather interesting because we're only at two out of six, I believe, of these. And we're not even fully gaining the independence of one nation. And he had a hand in several, which it means that this is going to build upon itself significantly. So I'm very excited to see that. But I'd imagine as one nation secures its independence, it would be more like a domino effect, and it would be easier for the nations around to gain independence. Um, so really, they need one big victory in this and they can probably pull this off well clearly it works out in some capacity because they're not in the spanish empire anymore but uh yeah I, I, I don't know this is very new very different this should be cool as the Jesus, part three. maria and san me? jose pulled away from the shores of venezuela one man stood on deck looking back he was a grimmer man, a harder man than the youth full of verve who, a handful of years earlier, had stumbled onto the shores of London. His wealth was gone, his power was gone, but his dreams were yet his. He vowed to return to those shores, and then turned away. That's so sad. <laughs> his defeat has given him a new vision, a new idea of what liberation must look like. He no longer thinks of Venezuela alone. He now thinks of all of Latin America. He realizes that no one nation is enough to fight off the might of Spain, even declining and corrupt as it is. Liberty would have to come to all nations or none. He has become pragmatic. If this was going to work, Latin America couldn't just be a loose federation as the fledgling United States had become after its revolution. They would need to be a strong, centralized power. They would need strong leadership, with an executive who could act swiftly and decisively to pull the people together and deflect any Spanish threat. But before he could act on any of this, he had to get- So it's, it's a very- he has a very expansive ideal of revolution, which honestly it seems- in, in one way, I could argue that his pragmatic nature actually makes him a little bit closer to the American revolutionary. But I think in the end, his ideals, uh, what he is fighting for, the... the uh, it, it comes off as, like, intellectually more French. I, I don't know. And I, I find it interesting because I can't fully associate him with one or another and both have happened he's had the opportunity to learn for both so with it being a gray area in my mind as to what he's doing that feels kind of appropriate so that's kind of cool get himself back into the action he was stuck in curacao a small island held by the british off the coast of venezuela and he was penniless 
the Spanish had confiscated all of his property, his mines, his lands, his slaves, all gone. He had bought his way into this revolution. How was he to continue without those funds? He was able to borrow a small amount from a merchant, just enough to hire a boat and equip a small band of men to sail for New Granada, where he had heard the revolution was still alive. And the revolution he found there was indeed alive, but it was fractured. Dope. Different groups vying for power in different regions. The well, whole country natural. splintered. He had work to do. He rapidly won the admiration of their nominal president, and he and his band were commissioned to fight in the New Granada Rebellion. The local commanders, however, were none too eager to see this foreign revolutionary, one who had just handed his former commander to the Spanish. They sent him <laughs> Indeed, off to garrison that... a small town. But this time, he would do that more than merely dream of glory. He if you're willing to, uh, and it, it's not really a betrayal, it's responding to what he perceives as betrayal, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Perception is everything. And if they see him as one who is likely to betray which you know they could misinterpret what's going on then you know i'd like that could easily reflect upon their willingness to work with them so perfectly natural uh to be skeptical especially during these delicate times um hey neron welcome back uh we are running through uh simone bolivar the uh, latin american revolutionary uh, it's a six-part series by uh extra history um uh, and we're enjoying it so far. So that's what you have missed so far. Um, we're not even halfway done, though, so you're going to be able to catch the bulk of it, fortunately. Wrote, spreading his ideas to the world. He socialized, gaining the support of the local elite, and he walked among the people, gaining the support of the poor, the indigent, the downtrodden. His small band of 70 quickly grew to 200. Then he saw an opportunity. A group of royalists had occupied a position on a nearby river, cutting off revolutionary forces. He wrote to command to ask permission to dislodge them. His request was denied. He went anyway. His men built small boats and they paddled up the river. He sent one man ahead to offer the enemy garrison commander, Episode a garrison three, yeah. which numbered 500 by the way, an opportunity to surrender. The man just laughed and turned this envoy away. Then Bolivar's men came around the bend and leapt out of their boats, guns blazing. The garrison scattered in terror, leaving behind a large cache of weapons and munitions. Bolivar turned to the people of the occupied town and exhorted them to join his cause, and again his ranks grew. Over the next 15 days, he waged a lightning campaign. His men were like phantoms. They moved faster than anybody expected, and they always approached from ways thought impassable. Thick jungle, pestilential swamps. Each time they struck, a new town fell. And with each town, his small force grew more towards becoming an army. At the end of those 15 mm. days, he had liberated 500 kilometers of vital riverway and changed the course of the Granadan fight for independence. But his conquests had taken him right to the border of Venezuela, and his mind again began to turn to liberating his homeland. After a couple more brilliant victories and the final ass- That is, I, like, I see why he wants to do that, but that feels like a decision driven by passion more than the pragmatic side of him. Perhaps it would be better to liberate uh, some other parts, small bits at a time before going for that. But like he has this attachment to Venezuela. So I don't know how well this is going to work out. I don't know if this is wise for him to jump to this right now. Like he's finding a little bit of success here, but it still feels early, but there's also going to be probably retaliation for what he's doing, so maybe it's best that he just keeps moving forward. Assurance of liberty for Granada, he began to march towards his suffering nation. For in Venezuela, the reprisals of the Spanish had been swift and brutal. Bolivar may have had the connections to escape, but most weren't so lucky. Mass executions, rapine, and plunder were rampant. Not even children were spared. But most of the Granadans didn't want to fight to liberate another country. So with only 500 ill, undersupplied, and undertrained troops, Bolivar crossed once again into his homeland. Through guile, surprise, and fear, he rapidly won another string of victories, swelling his ranks once again. But Bolivar's earlier losses had changed him. He was a sterner man, a grimmer man, and he would meet the Spanish atrocity for atrocity. Soon after entering Venezuela, he declared, our vengeance shall rival Spanish ferocity. 
our goodwill is at last exhausted, and since our oppressors compel us to mortal warfare, they shall disappear from America, and our land shall be purged of the monsters that infest it. Our hate shall be inexorable, and our war shall be to the death. And he decreed a death sentence for all Spaniards who did not turn against Spain. It galvanized the revolutionaries and drove Republic- That's way more French. Okay, well, you know, to be fair, I guess, the Americans, as revolution starts picking up and you start seeing more people fall into whether it's the patriot uh, category or loyalist category, uh, there was a lot of retaliation against uh, those who deem themselves loyalist. So there was like an unforgiving nature uh, against those who would deem themselves friendly to the British crown during times where they're trying to break away. Uh, but like the darkness of the language, like the bloody nature of it, while it resembles that of like Thomas Jefferson's lines where like the tree of liberty needs to be uh, watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants every once in a while. Um, it's its natural fertilizer. It's some, something like that. I butchered that quote. Uh, while that is a Thomas Jefferson quote, and he's very, uh, uh, he's very much identified with the American Revolution, it's that sort of dark imagery really fits the French Revolution a little bit more, and that's more what I'm feeling in this. ...to his cause, but it also laid the groundwork for a legacy of blood. Still, his lightning campaign dashed Spanish resistance at Merida, Trujillo, Barquisimeto, and Valencia. And soon, less than a year after he had slipped off in disgrace, he was returning to Caracas, the conquering hero. Caracas. He was celebrated in the streets. He had liberated Venezuela. But the work was not Sick. yet done. The Spanish still had a holdout a hundred miles away, slave uprisings had broken out against the white-led rebellion, and, as would prove worst of all, the Legion of Hell had declared for the Spanish cause. And their name barely does them justice. They were the brutal horsemen of the plains, owing no loyalty to anyone, horsemen living the in the plains. saddle like Mongols, and holding life, both their own and those they faced, cheap. They were a nightmare that stalked Venezuela. Armed with fire-hardened spears rather than any modern weaponry, they would show up at a town, run down the men as they fled, rape the women, and play cruel games where they would impale the children on their lances, leaving the infants there as a gruesome totem for when they rode into battle. And they neither gave nor expected quarter. When they would fight the Republican troops, they would throw themselves at them in mounted waves, overwhelming their firearms with sheer mass and ferocity. And when they won, not a man was spared. And so now, Bolivar's proclamation that this would be a war to the death had truly come to be. But instead of it being a war Seems to the so. death with the Spanish, it was a war to the death with his own people, becoming a civil war spilling out on racial lines. Because his troops too slaughtered their prisoners, and murdered any of the Legion of Hell that would fall into their hands, often dismembering them and leaving pieces on spikes for all to see. In the midst of all this, any pretense to republicanism disappeared, as Bolivar centralized all power in himself. Meanwhile, atrocities continued to mount. Spaniards wore the ears of the dead as trophies, the Legion left whole villages with nothing but ghosts, and he himself ordered a thousand prisoners, not even POWs, decapitated one by one. Jeez. And with each passing day, his hold was slipping. Every victory in the field was offset by the fact that the Legion and the slave uprisings could recruit men far faster than he could, as the vast mixed race and black population saw an opportunity to attack those who had oppressed them. The economy- You know, that seems, uh, seems appropriate. I mean, during times of chaos, it's a great time for a slave rebellion. Um, uh, what time, at what point is this? We've probably already seen the Haitian Revolution, right? I, I- I don't remember what year we're in right now, but they've probably already seen that. And that's a huge uh, example of like a slave rebellion done right in a colonial slave colony. The economy was in tatters and couldn't supply his army or even build new guns. And every victory came at a cost in irreplaceable men. Oh, we've definitely Soon seen the Haitian Revolution at this year olds point. under arms. Venezuela was awash in blood, and attrition and time took their toll. On June 15, 1814, waves of horsemen crashed through Republican lines at La Puerta, a critical pass. A month later, they were in Caracas. 
panic filled the streets. People fled, run down by horsemen as they tried to get away. Bolivar escaped and rallied his troops to one more time put up a desperate last stand. But by now, the forces he'd been using to bottle up the Spanish had been siphoned off, and the Spanish royalists' forces had been able to re-coalesce. In the final battle, heavily outnumbered, Bolivar's Republicans sold themselves dearly, but it would not be enough. And so, the Second Republic collapsed. Not from the might of the Spanish, but from the weight of its own internal divisions. And for the second time, Bolivar found himself on a boat, sailing to New Granada, looking back at a republic that might have been. Dude, this is, it gives me, uh, I guess kind of Che Guevara vibes. Not, not exactly, but kind of like that, uh, that scale of what he's trying to do it, it it feels something like that i'd imagine there's got to be some inspiration there i know uh uh a lot of che Guevara's inspirations came from other revolutions i'm sure there must have been some uh knowledge of simon bolivar especially with where he comes from it's not too far off Again, Simon Bolivar retreated to New Granada to reignite the revolution. But New Granada was not the place Bolivar had left it. The state had fatally fractured. Much of the country was controlled by a man who had violently opposed Bolivar's expedition to Venezuela. The two came into conflict. Bolivar's ragged army was not allowed to rest or resupply. The situation got desperate, escalated, and then word came. The unthinkable had happened. Word. The British had kicked Napoleon out of Spain. Oh, jeez, there we are. The reinstated Spanish king set to putting his empire in order. Just when I forget about, like, mainland conflicts, they come right back. I'm thinking, like, oh, this is just going to be happening in South America. And then I'm like, oh, wait, more stuff is going to be happening in Europe right now. And that's definitely going to impact this and sent thousands of Spanish veterans fresh from the Napoleonic Wars to crush the Granadan Revolution. Split and disunited as they were, weakened by previous losses, the Republican forces stood no chance. Disarmed and penniless, Bolivar made his escape to Jamaica, where he would spend the next two years. But there, his previous ideas would return to him with renewed force. He would look back on the disasters and the bloodshed and decide two things. First, that no one nation would find its independence alone. Independence for Venezuela would not only require independence for all Spanish America, but the formation of one great state that could rival Spain. And second, that to do that so, would be a very must also get rid nation. of internal divides. The fact that the Creoles, the Africans, the mixed-race population, and the Native Americans were all at one another's throat made any revolution impossible. It made any attempt to form a republic descend into anarchy and civil war. But his reverie was disturbed by an attempt on his life. His manservant, in the dead of night, crept into his room and stabbed over and oh. over and over again the man sleeping in his hammock. Only the vicissitudes of fortune him. had placed another man there that night, Bolivar's former paymaster. He had oh, journeyed no. to see Bolivar, and upon not finding him home, lay down to rest, only to be mortally mistaken for his boss. But though he that is incredibly convenient for Bolivar, um, that I, when he was starting to describe this, I was thinking like, oh, he must have caught wind of it, and then placed a double in his bed. But no, it's just totally an accident. He had dodged death. This was enough for Lovely. Bolivar. He knew he had to leave Jamaica. This time he made his way to Haiti, where he at last found the support he couldn't raise anywhere else. But it came with a price. Haiti had been a slave colony. It had become free through its own revolution, won by Glad slaves Hades who rose up. up and declared the land their own. Now Poussaint. their president yeah. offered to arm Bolivar if he would set the slaves of Spanish... I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Toussaint Leventure, Le, I, I've never really been able to say his name correctly, but the Haitian Revolution is fascinating. That's probably so, I think they have a series on the Haitian Revolution that we should probably check out soon. America free. Bolivar neither denied the help nor dismissed the idea. And so he started again to marshal a force for an invasion of the mainland, drawing to him all sorts of wild characters, 
adventurers, and die-hard patriots. The wildest of all perhaps being Gregor McGregor, a Scotsman who McGregor. brought to the fray those mightiest Scottish weapons. There's so many dumb names. Oh my god. Uh, I learned about a guy the other day. Like, dumb names throughout history. I guess that's that's not that dumb. I learned about a guy the other day named Preserved Fish. And his father's name was Preserved Fish. And his grandfather's name was Preserved Fish. But that... It's not that level of dumb, but it's pretty dumb. Toussaint Louverture. Yeah. That, that's... I appreciate the phonetic spelling because, like, you know, I can't, uh, can't figure that stuff out ever. Weapons of war, the kilt and the bagpipes. And the war was on. Or, well, no, it wasn't, because Bolivar made a slight detour with his entire fleet to pick up one of his mistresses. But after that, yes, the war was on. Or rather, it was all over the place. If you can make a mess of disasters, Bolivar certainly did it here. His forces squandered and in disarray, soon he found himself fleeing back to Haiti, leaving what little of his country that wasn't in royalist hands in the hands of warlords. But he had lived up to his promise. He had proclaimed freedom for all slaves, and so Pétion, the president of the Haitian Republic, welcomed him back and offered to arm him once again. Bolivar's force was small, but this time he learned. This time he knew that, rather than simply focusing on the big cities, he had to win the countryside. And so he drew his it's remaining so much revolutionary friends from. to his side, and Control with the his supply proclamation lines. of liberation, he drew in former slaves who had once been his enemies. But perhaps most surprising, and most important, the leader of the Legion of Hell had died, and the new leader of these Plains horsemen saw more benefit in aligning his forces with the new, more egalitarian revolutionaries than with the Spanish. And while his horsemen were winning victories, Bolivar saw an opportunity. In the rainy season, long after campaigning would normally come to a halt, in a move reminiscent of nothing so much as Hannibal's crossing the Alps, Bolivar decides to take those- I've learned about that! We, we, we learned about that watching these guys. There we go. <laughs> oh, it all comes back. ...men who would follow him and cross the Andes into New Granada. The trek is brutal. Vicious wind whips at them, food is scarce, men and horses freeze to death. But in July, the middle of South American winter, his forces appear from out of the mountains, gaunt and sallow but alive and ready to fight. With every step through the countryside, Bolivar raised more men, for New Granada had been independent for six years and hadn't had the revolution beaten out of it the same way Venezuela had. And so, yeah. with his ranks growing, he moved toward the lightly defended capital of Bogota. The enemy was taken by complete surprise. Spanish forces were scattered, there was almost no garrison at the capital, and no force blocking the path from Bolivar's unexpected entry point into the country of Bogota. So the Spanish forces raced toward the capital in an effort to get there before Bolivar's army, but Bolivar moved to intercept them, even Ooh. though his force was much smaller, and the men Love he had boy. that weren't exhausted from the journey over the mountains were woefully undertrained. But his speed and tenacity won again, and in battle after battle, he overtook and surprised Spanish forces, crushing the Spanish will to fight. At last, he captured Bogota. The Spanish Viceroy so had fled, sick. and he'd been in such a hurry to escape Bolivar's onrushing army that he'd left the treasury behind, and the armory stocked. Bolivar, at last, had the resources he needed to wage the campaign that he had always envisioned. Some time ago, he had given in to the democratic clamor of the people, and had at last yeah. established a congress. Now he summoned them to the recaptured capital. He wanted to set in motion the first part of his bold plan. He called on them to establish the nation of Gran Colombia. And so, on the Grand 17th Columbia. of December, 1821, Gran Colombia was formed. Gran Colombia would that. be a state large enough and powerful. I don't know much about that, but I know that that existed. I knew we were going to get here eventually. Powerful enough to maintain its independence. It would combine New Granada, Venezuela, and Quito, which we now roughly know as Ecuador, into one massive nation, capable of securing Quito, its liberty Ecuador. forever. I don't know how there you got there, but you got there. There was a minor problem with this plan. At the time, the Spanish still controlled Venezuela, Quito, and about half of New Granada. But Bolivar was never one to sweat the details, and so set about marshalling troops to make his invented nation a reality. Luckily for him, almost I mean, you have something a revolt physical to fight up for, an idea to fight for now, the king's I guess. ability I to know. reinforce his American colonies and pulling Spanish attention away from colonial affairs. 
With this news, one of Bolivar's great enemies, the Captain General of Venezuela, the man who had been called in to so violently and brutally put down the colonial revolt and reestablish Spanish rule, asked to be recalled and left the... I mean, I, I'm not surprised that uh, Gran Colombia was unstable. I mean, like the scale of this project and how, how fast he's attempting to put this in motion. Like, this uh, should take generations, but I... He's just going right for it. The Americas forever. One by Quito one, is the name of the, the capital of Ecuador. The okay, ship. there we go. It's not so, familiar. at last, Bolivar once again swept back into his home country. But for the first time in his life, he was leading a larger, better armed force than that he faced. And this time, his men carried with them a sense of victory. A sense that was realized at the Battle of Carabobo on the 24th of June, 1821. Bolivar had caught the royalists on the road from Valencia. It was to be the decisive fight. The Spanish drew up and pushed the Republican forces hard. The line wavered, but the British Legion held firm, and the rest of the Republicans regained their confidence. Then Bolivar's cavalry swung in. The band of horsemen the royalists had with them simply vanished from the battlefield. The loyalties of the local horsemen had long since changed, and Bolivar's lancers tore through the Spanish line. Soon it was over. Spanish power had been broken. The last royalists wouldn't be pushed out for two more years, but with the victory at Carabobo, Venezuela finally, truly, became free. But Sick. Gran Colombia wasn't done yet. Quito had been undergoing a slow and grinding revolutionary campaign for about a year, and it looked to be at somewhat of a stalemate. The men, material, and supplies of Gran Colombia were about to change all that. Yes, Bolivar was sending someone else weapons and troops. Revolution indeed. By the middle of 1822, that, that in a dramatic battle 3,500 feet above sea level, the question of Quito was decided. Here too the Spanish were repulsed, and here too the local populace overwhelmingly proclaimed their desire to join Gran Colombia. But Bolivar's work was not done. The royalists still had a stronghold on the continent. They still held the territory of Peru. Bolivar quickly got himself declared dictator of Peru, which is a little awkward because he's already yeah. president of Gran Colombia, but hey, why let your current job as a democratic head of state get in the way of a good dictatorship? As such... Yeah, I... Reading his Wikipedia is kind of confusing because it puts... It lists all of his positions he had under there. And I'm like, oh, this guy's weird. Because, <laughs> like, these things seem to... And, and a, a dictatorship in a lot of ways feels like it contradicts a lot of the ideals that he seems to have but in a lot of ways in uh, republican societies there is precedent for uh at least a temporary dictatorship uh that that goes back uh to the romans i believe maybe further i don't know that might have been taken from the greek mo greeks most th most things are taken from the greeks um but they would have like these temporary dictatorships in times of struggle, and then the dictator would abdicate power. But he galvanized the efforts to throw. I don't know off if he even plans on doing that. But then he fell. There is precedent. Dreadfully ill. The army was plagued with revolts and counter revolts. Large sections of the fighting force changed sides and then changed sides again. But as the disturbances in Spain grew, and the king rolled back all the policies made by its short-lived constitutional government and declared his power absolute, it only further fractured the royalist cause in Peru. This wasn't lost on Bolivar, who, while recovering, started another campaign against the royalists, knowing full well that, with access to the resources of his newly formed Gran Colombia, all he had to do was wear the remaining forces down. It all came to a head when he had a large royalist force contained in the mountains. The royalist position was supremely defensible, but Bolivar knew that they didn't have the supplies to survive in the mountains long, so all he had to do was wait. And wait he did, until the royalists finally attacked out of desperation. But the very things that made their position so good for defense hampered their every move. Their units were raked with gunfire as they tried to clamber down the mountainside. Their unit cohesion was disrupted. Order was hard to maintain. As the sun passed its zenith, the royalist viceroy was captured. It was clear their lines were starting to disintegrate. Terms were offered, terms were accepted. Peru, too, was now free. Join us next time as Bolivar offers to bring Peru into Gran Colombia and 
Oh, sorry. With the war funny. over, the real work of state building begins. That's the part that I'm more interested in. Like, even with my own country's revolution, uh, I like the ideals. I, I'm kind of interested in the military aspects of things. That's all fun and nice. But I really start to pay attention when it comes to actually building the nation that's supposed to uh, embody your ideals that you've been preaching. So... This should be a blast. Um, this this is where I I really start to enjoy it. I'm sure. Like I've enjoyed it so far. The revolutionary stuff is always fascinating, but this is the stage of the revolution that I personally find the most interesting. You good, dude? Want to say hi to the people? There he is. Say hi. All right, With the we got liberation two more, of I think. Peru. A lifetime of labor had come to its fruition. The Spanish were, at last, pushed off the continent. Bolivar had conquered more territory than Napoleon, and he was hailed as El Libertador, from Lima to Bogota. Yeah. When he looked about him, he saw a glorious army, cheering peoples and a world full of possibility. But he also saw a world devastated by years of brutal war. It would take much to turn the ashes of the Spanish Empire into the republic he had dreamed of in his youth. Okay. Like, comparing him to uh, Napoleon is very interesting, and there are parallels there. Uh, but I think they're both, they are both seem so unique in their own ways, because they, while they are both... Uh, they both take somewhat similar positions coming from, like, uh, the consequences of empire, uh, they are also uh, taking over very different spaces which makes it, it makes it easy to find parallels but they're not perfect i can find better parallels uh with simone bolivar and other revolutionaries uh, napoleon is very unique and it, it's hard to find people who are quite like napoleon but you you can see it it's there With the expulsion of the Spanish from Peru, Bolivar had thought his work would be done, but standing there in Lima, having just accepted the office of President of Peru, he finally had time to look up from the business of war and see just what a state the country was in. There were armies scattered throughout the nation, each with little loyalty but to whomever led it. There were other claimants to the presidency, and questions not only of his political legitimacy but the legitimacy of the whole Peruvian Congress. The economy yeah. was in tatters. The social inequality between native peoples, slaves, mixed-race peoples, and whites was a powder keg just waiting to tear the country apart. And to top <laughs> it all off, here he was at the head of a foreign army, having just liberated the country, but that liberation might start to look very much like something else if he did not quietly return home with his soldiers soon. But that was never Bolivar's way. He was gonna fix the whole thing. He had Congress confer upon him nearly dictatorial powers, but even with such powers, he was stymied at every turn. He just didn't have a sense of the intent. That is where he becomes a bit more like Napoleon. He, he comes in representing a certain ideal, but then it's like, okay, but to gain stability, I can't have little things like republicanism stepping in my way. Uh, so that's one of the places where the parallels might be the strongest, where they, they're, they're just not, uh, perfectly in line with the original ideals that are, uh, thrust upon them in a lot of ways. Like, what they symbolize is not what they seem to be, especially once he gets to this stage that he's starting to get into a pretty strong gray area. And fact. And it's for the sake of stability, and you gotta have it, but uh, there's definitely a line where you abandon the original idea for the sake of uh, having something stable. ...actions and loyalties that ran deep in Peruvian politics. He often lamented that he had never stepped foot into Peru, but at the same time, Peru was now part of his plan, part of his ambition for a great South American state, or at least a federation. If he was to achieve that, he had work to do. 
he immediately set out to reorganize the government, reform the treasury, reform the legal system, and rethink how education was provided. He took a whirlwind tour of the country, appointing everyone from the mayors to the local schoolmasters in many of the towns he visited, but it was never enough. Peru was a royalist country, but more than that, its people were just worn out. Much of the zeal for revolution and for all of the new projects that would bring was carried only by the charisma of Bolivar. As soon as he would leave a town, it would slide back into its torpor, his work mm. undone. To his joy, he found that his old schoolmaster, the very man who had introduced him to many of the revolutionary ideas that shaped him, had returned from exile. Bolivar immediately put his old tutor in charge of the school system. But like so many that Bolivar appointed, he was not a man up to the task. He tried earnestly, he had the passion, but he didn't have the capacity to plan and organize. He had been a great one-on-one -on -one tutor, but when given the job of systemizing and marshalling the logistics for a whole nation's education, he was woefully out of his depth. And so it went across Peru. Progress and reforms were slow. Uh, during times of instability, like when you're building empire like that, you often are struggling with like who can do the job and who can you trust and often they will opt for who you can trust more than who is most capable of the job because it's so easy for things to fall apart you'd probably rather have somebody who's a little less competent but you know you have their loyalty if you're in Bolivar's position, though that might seem silly from the outside, you can kind of get where he's coming from. But better news was coming from other quarters. Nations in Europe had begun to officially recognize his Republic of Gran Colombia, and Antonio José de Sucre, the young general he had sent to the separate province known as Upper Peru, had won some astounding victories and liberated the whole region. But Upper Peru, too, came with its own questions. It was rich in silver, and so its sovereignty was hotly in dispute. Would it become part of the yet war-torn Argentina? Would it be put under the yoke of the newly liberated Peru? Or would it become a new nation unto itself? Well, when the local Congress declared that they would be an independent republic, Bolivar certainly didn't object. Maybe this was because the new rich republic could join the confederation he was putting together without all of the baggage that he saw coming with the rest of Peru. Maybe it was because they invited him to come and write their constitution. Or maybe I it mean, was because might... they named their new nation Bolivar. Actually, that might have been the reason. Of course, they did change the name to Bolivia a few days later, once somebody pointed out that, guys, Rome wasn't called Romulus, come on. Really, they should just call the place Bolivia or something. But the gesture was there, and yeah, Bolivar that, was, without uh, a doubt, eager yeah, to write point. their constitution. And so the Congress declared him- I didn't know it was originally named Bolivar. I guess, I guess you know, only a few days that that would slip under my radar, but that that's actually a fun little fact president of Bolivia, which is only a little awkward because he was technically already president of Gran Colombia and the president of Peru, but hey, like why let your current job as the everywhere. head of two different democratic states get in the way of a little constitution writing? And Bolivar really thought that this would be his legacy. He thought that this new constitution would solve all of the problems that he saw burning through Spanish America. He worked on it feverishly, and in some ways, it was all that you'd have expected from the idealistic young man who swore an oath to liberate his people on the hills outside of Rome. The Constitution abolished slavery, guaranteed freedom That's of the press cool. and freedom of movement. It established a legal system based upon trial by jury rather than by magistrates. But there was one difference from what you might have expected out of a man- That all seems fantastic. Where is it gonna go wrong? and enamored of the idea of liberty and of a free republic. His constitution also stipulated that the president would serve for life, with the right oh, to no. choose his own successor. Now, Bolivar said... So, that, that's just another monarchy by any other means. In the United States, we had kind of this issue um, where a lot of people were not sure where the president's powers actually were when we were first establishing it like how powerful really is the president and some people accused it of just being an elected monarch this is even less uh uh vague here Th this is uh very clearly a monarch that he had put all sorts of checks in there to make sure that the president acted in good faith, but you can see why this president for life Maybe with a limited monarch, successor but... business sounded a little bit worrisome to people. 
Reactions to the Constitutions were, shall we say, mixed. Very few people openly criticized it, but it was readily adopted only yeah, in monarchy where all Bolivar but and his army were actually located. Even Indeed. in Bolivia, it was adopted only with reluctance, and only when Sucre, the general who had liberated the region, agreed to hold the post of president, but then resign after two years. But all of this cost time. Precious, precious time. While Bolivar was hiking around Peru, while he was micromanaging towns, while he was pinning his bold constitution, other men had been serving as the heads of the various states that he'd liberated. Venezuela, the former territory of New Granada, Bolivia, Quito, which we now know as Ecuador, each had their own head of state, and as time passed, each became more entrenched. Each saw their own power grow, and each found reasons to see the others as rivals. Gran Colombia, the state which Bolivar was supposed to be running, the first state which he had been granted the presidency of, was tottering on the edge of financial collapse. The army which he'd been gallivanting around Peru with, it was funded from Gran Colombia. The vice president that he had left in charge of Gran Colombia had been sending him increasingly urgent letters about the fact that they were going to have to shrink the army or face ruin. To make matters worse, Spanish America had never had the sense of oneness that the British colonies had. For centuries, they'd treated each other as rivals. They were as culturally different as the United States North and South but the Spanish crown had kept them even more separated in terms of economic and infrastructural ties. The Grand Colombian experiment was the first time these nations had really tried to come together, and many in Grand Colombia felt that the experiment was going poorly. So cracks began to show. Caracas chafed at the rule of Bogota. Caracas. Quito questioned its place in the Republic. Oh. Soon, stirrings Sorry. began for a federated Sorry. system, more like the United States. Not the United States we know today, but rather the loose federation of states that served as the U.S. at its inception. The same federation yeah. that proved too weak to stand on its own and eventually had to be made into a republic. But Bolivar knew that a federated state would never survive. That if there was no strong central authority to hold them together, these states would simply fall back into their national bickering, and in the end, the whole project would be undone. And yes. Agreed. But the problem is that he doesn't have faith in it to go on without him. That That's clearly why the... Uh, the monarch for life thing is a thing uh i think that's kind of like while there are plenty of critiques to have of george washington i think one of the stronger things he did was make it so that we could kind of trust in a system of uh, good faith succession which worked out for most of our history um we had a couple uh a couple issues around uh not not the most peaceful succession of power, but more or less, we I think we've done a pretty good job for the amount of time we've been around. Uh, and that's one of the strong things about it. But Bolivar doesn't seem to have that same faith in uh, countries to make decisions without him. He, he's got to be willing to let the country move on. And uh, if he's president for life he's not giving it that chance to find its way without him being the guiding hand and then there's a very good chance that they won't have that though he did ensure that he would have uh, a large part in uh, selecting his successor so that must be his hope there uh, but one man's vision it, it's a bit too narrow given how complex a region this is and so he called a Congress, a meeting of the Americas, I to work it all out. Join us next time to find out where that Congress leads us and where it leaves Bolivar. So this is about to be it. We're about to do the last one. And then after that, I'm probably going to have to take some suggestions for what ones I should do in the following weeks, because... Uh, I think this is the last extra history thing that I had in the poll that I put up many 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 months ago uh so i'm gonna be able to pick whatever next time and you know if you guys have any suggestions uh, i'll be uh i'll be checking the chat at the end of this one uh to see what i should do maybe i'll do another poll we'll see uh let's see this let's see how this ends all of simon's hopes were pinned to his great conference it was going to be like the Amphictyonic League that had once, centuries ago, brought all the Greeks together in a common confederation, a common understanding of who they were. 
The most common phrase used today to describe the Congress of Panama is a resounding failure. Oh, really? Who would have thunk? Bolivar decided not to attend the Congress of Panama. Too many rumors were already circulating about him wanting to make himself a king, and he wanted to show that the Congress he was a king. He's free already a of king. his influence. But unfortunately, Bolivar's influence was the only thing still holding this fragile idea of a Pan-American League together. The Peruvians long felt that he had overstayed his welcome in their country, and they wanted nothing to do with joining mm. Gran Colombia. Brazil was a monarchy, and so wanted nothing to do with these fledgling republics. Argentina was terrified of being steamrolled by Gran Colombia, and so wanted nothing to do with the Congress in general. And the Bolivian delegates? They just didn't make it there in time. Worse still, Bolivar's vice president, Santander, the man he had left in charge of Gran Colombia, had now been running Gran Colombia for so long that he chafed at the idea of Bolivar reasserting himself over the country that he'd essentially abandoned. So That's even Santander takes. was no help in forwarding Bolivar's cause at all. But even as the Congress fell apart, more bad news was on the way. While he was still in Peru, a plot on Bolivar's life was uncovered. The plan was to kill Bolivar and expel all Colombians from the country, reasserting Peru as its own state. Bolivar responded swiftly, exiling or executing those involved, but while history largely sees these sentences as justified, they did nothing to win him popularity in Peru. Then mm. another misfortune struck. One of Bolivar's most trusted generals, Paez, the man who had led his cavalry, who had inspired the plainsmen, who had been instrumental in winning Bolivar the war, rebelled. But his rebellion oh, really? was an odd one. He rebelled can, for can Bolivar. He called for Venezuela to, to like break that. from Gran Colombia and shake off the rules of Santander, the vice president that Bolivar had left Sorry, in Bogota, to Colombia. He rebelled <laughs> Forgive for me. Bolivar. He called for Venezuela to break from Gran Colombia and shake off the rules of Santander, the vice president that Bolivar had left in Bogota. And Just so now Bolivar perpetual had both his general, huh? Paez, and his vice president, Santander, begging for him to return with his army and help him crush the other guy, for the sake of the revolution. Hey Riley, doing so all right. Bolivar Thanks returned for joining to us. Gran Colombia, not to take sides, but to heal the breach. And that he did, for a little while. Because even his enemies said that when they were with him, they could not help but love him. It was like a spell. The guy had charisma in spades. All their grievances melted before his energy and open arms. But as soon as he was out of sight, all those enmities would spring up again. And his health was not what it once was. He was now gaunt, skeleton. Simon Bolivar planned to invade Paraguay for the imprisonment of a French botanic. Uh, friend of Bolivar. Oh, okay. You know, that feels in character. He, he, he seems like he gets caught up in his passion. Uh, as we're seeing more of here, um, that, that's something we often find with revolutionaries, even the more pragmatic ones. Um, you can't get there without like an unusual degree of passion, which can cause you to make some uh, questionable decisions. Eaten by consumption, the very disease that had taken his parents. But he was never one to quit, and so he took back up the mantle of power in Gran Colombia. But his dictatorial ways isolated him more and more. And as he traveled the countryside, he saw the true effects of his revolution, of his re You either die a hero or you live long enough to become a villain. It feels like it's one of those situations where he, he has like this Republican air to him and it, it's just gone. It's like an absolute power corrupts absolutely if I can throw out any more uh, cliches at you right now. But it is kind of a, he's living a cliche in a lot of ways um the the natural path of uh the revolutionary who gains power and and how the power changes you republic he saw a wasteland with roads destroyed crops untended the populace that he had freed were worse off now than when he'd stood outside of rome so many years ago and when he tried to do anything about it he was met time and again with one unassailable fact the country's treasury was empty. Santander had even negotiated a huge loan from the British to help keep the government afloat, but that loan was already gone, under whispers of corruption and mismanagement. More even than corruption, though, there was one all-consuming source that had swallowed up the money, and that was the army. For years now, Gran Colombia had essentially footed the bill for Bolivar to gallivant through Spanish America, liberating country after country. Revolutions aren't cheap, 
and Gran Colombia had just paid for at least six. Now the people of Gran Colombia strained against that yoke, but Bolivar, beset on all sides by news of military setbacks, felt that he couldn't shrink the military right now. Peru had not only broken from the Federation, but invaded what was to become Ecuador. Bolivia was in turmoil and close to being lost. There were even insurrections in the heart of Gran Colombia. How could he risk reducing the army at this critical time? But it was the revolt of Peru that really tore a rift between Bolivar and his vice president Santander. Santander practically cheered the loss of Peru. Not having to garrison such a large and querulous state would save the government a fortune. But Bolivar saw Santander's reaction as a shot in the back. He saw Santander celebrating something which would ruin his grand project of a universal Spanish-American federation. He even began to suspect that Santander might have aided the rebellion. Bolivar was in the field when he got the news about Peru. Tensions flared, and things escalated. Santander abrogated the dictatorial powers that Bolivar had been given, and in response, Bolivar, the champion of democracy, turned his army around the champion and began of democracy, to march on Bogota, yeah. the very first capital. It seems like de democracy has become sort of something he can fall back on, but it makes him come off... He comes off as more cynical the further this goes along. I'm sure there's a complex nature to it, but from a first impression thing, um, it seems like he's just very self-centered, and it's like whatever can get him to his final vision. I think this is a, a very common thing amongst revolutionaries. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, I think, had a little bit of this if i'm gonna talk crap out about anybody i should probably talk crap about somebody from my own country um thomas jefferson i feel like he had all of these revolutionary ideals that didn't really manifest when he was in office and the methods by which he did things and the things he would complain about other people doing uh didn't necessarily uh those complaints didn't necessarily ring true uh, when he was in office. He, he didn't really stick to that, which... Uh, it, I think it's more he makes these arguments to get to the end that he needs, uh, and everything is about getting there, because the end is the inherent good in his mind. Uh, the means can change as long as you get to that end. Uh, he's more fluent with the means. Uh, when revolutionaries talk, you often think that, no, the, the, the end and the means matter, but for some of them, they're willing to be a little bit more flexible than that. Well, he had liberated. Surprisingly, when he got there, no blood was shed. An uneasy peace was formed, with the vice president still serving his office. But one thing was clear to Bolivar. The Constitution of Gran Colombia, one so different than the one he had pinned for his beloved Bolivia, was the problem. It kept getting in the way. It kept preventing him from doing what needed to be done. So he called for a great convention to rewrite the Constitution. But again, with Don't his forget. imperious march of the army against the capital of a country whose democracy he was supposed to defend, there were whispered charges of monarchism. Everyone well, said yeah. that Bolivar, like Napoleon, would try to give himself a crown. He's so Bolivar monarch. tried to remain hands Is up. it just the symbolic nature, like the fact that he just hasn't put a crown on yet that people are getting here? Because like crown or not, he's he's already he's already there. That that it's it's just strange to me. I I guess people with monarchy are those who will those who support monarchy or or fixate on monarchy are very caught up in the symbolism and i think you can do a lot if the symbolism uh uh conforms to what it needs to be so you can get away with being a monarch as long as you uh pretend hard enough that you're not off he wouldn't attend the convention he didn't even seem to lobby that hard for anything other than the convention simply taking place the voting for the delegates came in santander had campaigned vigorously and his men were elected in a landslide in the end, Bolivar only stayed in power because his delegates walked out, leaving the convention with one man less than the quorum they needed to hold a vote. Oh. He was forced to sabotage the very convention he'd set up. And in this moment, That's you get a sense of great sorrow. You see a man who recognized how far he had strayed from those ideals he lived for. But at the same time, you get a sense of a man who feels trapped. 
who feels compelled to take each individual action, even though each one is yet one more step away from his own desires. And so, That's with the convention in tatters, Bolivar once again took on complete dictatorial powers, abandoning all pretense of rule by Republic. And the assassination attempts started to roll in. More than once he was saved by his mistress, but his list of friends and comrades had been heard about her. Few. All that some much. had died in his wars, some had retired, done with public life, some he had alienated, and some, in the end, he had to put to the firing squad. Now one more from that list rebelled. The idea of a Latin American monarchy was pitched, and again, though he had not been directly connected with it, Bolivar was accused of looking to make himself king. With a heavy heart, one of his loyalist generals decided that there would be no peace for the nation, so long as there was Bolivar. And so, once again, Bolivar picked up the sword. Where once he had spent hours in the saddle, he could now only spend go an hour point. or two at a time before he was racked with coughing. But, though well past the vigor of his youth, eaten from the inside out by consumption, Bolivar still remained active, trying to manage the military- Like, that's an interesting question, Matthew, the- if this mirrors socialist revolutionaries, I, I, it's like the socialist revolutionaries borrowed from a lot. They almost certainly borrowed from uh, Bolivar. Uh, they, some of them leaned more towards like French revolutionary ideals. Some of them uh, leaned into other... Um, uh, revolutionary ideals. I, I mentioned earlier Ho Chi Minh uh, leaned into American uh, revolutionary ideals, basically quoting the Declaration of Independence back to the Americans, like throwing their own words back in their faces. So uh, I think socialist revolutionaries, uh, especially uh, uh, especially the more educated ones, were very well grounded in the history of revolution, and they, they would have definitely picked uh, from what they liked. And Bolivar clearly, despite where he is at this stage, he's, uh, he's definitely an interesting point of reference uh, for a revolutionary, not as much a socialist. ...and the affairs of states. But as another former friend met his death before his armies on the battlefield, Bolivar knew time was up. His health was failing. He would not live much longer. Of this he was acutely aware. He was reduced to ruin, declared an enemy in many of the states that he'd helped to free, and even banned from much of Venezuela, his homeland. His great dream was crumbling around him. One by one, all the states of Spanish America were abandoning his great project. Gran Colombia was disintegrating around him, and there was nothing he could do, frail skeleton of a man that he'd become. So, one last time, he tried to put affairs in order, to leave some part of the world that he'd tried to free ready for a world without him. He called together all the notable men of the revolution that were left and asked them to oversee the transition of power, to help keep the country together while he retired quietly back to Europe, which he had not Oof. seen since his youth. But even this was not to be. The government wouldn't let him go until new elections were held, and he was destitute. He sold his silverware in order to try to afford the trip. Dude. When the new elections were held, he the man that he'd asked this. all those great nobles to let be his successor didn't win. And so Bolivar slunk out of Bogota to make the arduous trip to Cartagena. But even the very ship he was to leave on ran aground, and so he sat, exiled in his own homeland, slowly wasting away like the nations he'd founded. After one last short trip, he died. Not on the battlefield, not with fanfare or ceremony, but of a lung rotting from the inside out. He had not left behind order. He had not left behind a single unified state. He had not left behind a lasting constitution or an enlightened code of laws. But he had left behind liberty. He was the Libertador. Dude. That was a really cool one. And as far as people introducing figures that I want to know more about, Bolivar is up there. Um, what he represents to uh, revolution, to revolutionaries, is clearly broader than what is just communicated in this. So I, I was really, uh, I was really into this one.